Okay, we will call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order. Thank you for coming out this evening. Um, could you please join me in saluting the flag? Where is the flag? <laughs> well, I think we all know the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for doing such a good job. <laughs> Invisible. Invisible, yes. Invisible. Okay, um, for those of you familiar with the process of the school committee, the next item on our agenda is the hearing of visitors. We have no visitors signed up, so we shall move on. Wanda, thank you. Okay, next item on our agenda is what's called the consent agenda. It is the routine business of the school committee that is that is uh, handled in bulk and at this time I ask any member of the school committee if they would like to remove any of the items as listed in the consent agenda okay seeing no one wants to remove anything can I have a motion to approve from someone thank you thank you um, any further discussion seeing none all in favor Okay, next item is communication. We have the report of the superintendent of schools. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, as usually is our practice, I'd like to introduce Jessica Freeborn from Brockton High School who will give us our student representative report. Jess? Um, well, it's going to be a really quiet week at Brockton High, so I'll start off with last Friday was our National History Day competition. It was very successful. There were great exhibits, websites, papers, so it was great. And some even did an acting skit as their presentation, so it was a very successful day, as I said. So congratulations to all those who competed. Moving on, um, mid-year exams begin Friday, so good luck to everyone who will be taking their mid-year exams. Yay! Um, and let's see, term two ends January 28th. So that's what's happening at Brockton High. I did get an opportunity uh, on, I'm losing track of the days, I think it was Friday, uh, getting up to Brockton High School to see National History Day and having conversation with a number of the administrators when you used to walk into the Azure cafeteria and certainly the uh, IRC area um, there were posters galore and of course the posters now are, are you know triple the posters with the research and the displays but what really is the change is a lot of the website and the research the web design so it, it, it's interesting to see with our Digital, lit digital literacy and uh, students using technology that things are really changing as far as how they present with a National History Day project. So again, congratulations to not only the students, I know this and I bet many of you join me in congratulating the parents that probably worked alongside their students and supported their National History Day project, certainly all of the teachers and the staff that were that were present. Um, again, a, another excellent display of, of the good things that happened. I, I finished up the evening by, uh, I have Donna putting in my schedule the sporting events so I can try to get to at least, you know, basketball and hockey, et cetera, the winter events. So I did finally get to a basketball game. Um, again, gym filled with, with patrons. It was against Bridgewater Raynham. Brockton, of course, was victorious. I believe their schedule is 10 and one or 11 and one. So they've, they've done an excellent job, um, you know, 20 cheerleaders, you know, stands filled with kids. So again, it's great to see, you know, what goes on at your, your Brockton High School. So, so thank you, Jess. Um, moving on, um, we do have uh, a presentation, and I'm going to start with that first. Uh, we have uh, a director of the Parent Information Center, Soraya DeBarro. So I'm going to ask her to come forward uh, for this review and presentation. And I know you'll join me, um, those of you that had the opportunity on Thursday in the middle of that freezing rain and icy conditions, we had the open house of our new uh, parent uh, information center 
which of course is across the street at the old community bank. This building is now owned by the city of Brockton. We have the health department in part of the building and our beautiful uh, parent information center. They did an excellent job uh, at the open house to show you what parents see when they come in, um, how parents are serviced, and so I will talk to you about that. But I also want to invite you, if you did not have an opportunity to see the Parent Information Center, I know Soraya will be very happy to take you around and give you a personal tour uh, at your convenience, but it is certainly worthwhile. I hope you get an opportunity to see it. So Soraya, oh, excuse me. Thank you. Good evening, school committee members. Good evening, Mrs. Smith and Mr. Minicello. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. I am, um, I said it this morning, I, I always say it, I'll keep saying it. I'm very proud of the Brockton Public Schools. I'm very proud of the work we do. And today, I'm, tonight I'm here to present on the um, enrollment and assignments for this, this school year, so 2014, 2015. Um, and you do have a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, just in case you would like to follow it. We are now, now located at 60 Crescent Street. Um, and those are four pictures of our new beautiful space. Parents c go in and um, it's, it's wonderful to see their faces as they walk in and they see how professional and how welcoming the place looks. And you see the flags there. Um, we try to get flags that represent the students that are now attending Brockton Public Schools. Okay, uh, and they're all, all over the office. So please come and visit us. And on the top um, right hand corner, um, that's the staff of the school registration office. That's my staff, how I call them. Uh, wonderful ladies, 13, 12 wonderful ladies who every day try their, their best and give their best to the system, to the families, to the students that we have. And today I would like to say that this report, it's not my report, my personal report. It's the report of a group of people that have worked endless hours to make this happen. It's also the report of the um, of everyone who has helped, going from the administration to the schools, to the families, to everyone involved, and to all the staff of Brockton Public Schools. Um, SERPIC, School Registration Office, has become a vital office for the Brockton Public Schools and for all the parents. We do pre-K through 12 registrations and transfers, and we have many responsibilities, and among them we, ha we register and transfer students, we do lunch applications, we verify school enrollment for parents, we do appeal school placements, uh, it's a place where parents can appeal the school placements and assignments in case they don't like the school or they don't want the school that I have assigned their children to. It's also a place where we um, assign transportation to students, um, to all students in Brockton and we disseminate information to parents on different programs and offer offerings within BPS. These are some highlights of the spring and summer registrations for the 2014-2015 school year. Since February of last year until November 1st of 2014, we did 5,240 pre-K through 12 to grade 12 registrations and transfers. I usually call them transactions, and this morning I said, since we are in a bank location, I'm gonna keep calling them transactions. So we did all of those, and we did 78 more registrations this year for this school year than for last school year. Out of those, uh, 4,150 or 79% were minority students, while 1,090 students were um, non-minority children. And uh, out of that number, 3,394, or 65 percent of those registrations, they were registrations or students returning from other school systems to us, students that were ours, left, and now are coming back. So a huge number, 3,394. And we have some um, students and parents that went through the registration process, we assigned students, and they also ended up not coming to Brockton. So those numbers do, are not counted in those 3,394. Um, also out of um, 5,240, 1,846 were transfers 
And when we say transfers, we say transfers within the system, administrative transfers, transfers because they moved, and there's a lot of movement within Brockton, so people do move a lot. So when they move from one zone to the other because they don't have transportation or they cannot transport their children to school, we do have to transfer schools. Um, out of zone requests, students that live in a zone want to go to a different zone, those are also considered transfers. Um, students that were mainstreamed from bilingual program, the bilingual program or from the SPED program, they were also they also went through us for transfers, grade six registrations and tag placements. All of those were done throughout this time. So like I said, we do it all. Um, how do we assign students? This is based on the school committee um, guidelines that was approved a couple of years ago. The first one is complete and timely registration. We assign students based on when they complete a file and if the file, for example, for kindergarten, we do not assign students unless their file is complete. Okay. Um, seat availability, that's the second cri um, criterion. We also look to see if we have seats at the schools where, at the school where the parent has chosen for the child to attend. If we don't have schools, then we go to the second choice, the third choice, or I will assign um, that child to a school that I think um, is the closest and where um, we have seats available. Sibling preference. Um, we also assign if, if a child has a sibling going to the George, for example, and the sibling, and we still have seats at the George, we will assign that sibling to the George. So sibling preferences, preference is giving to siblings when we first assign. So if we have a thousand students that we have to assign, we look at all of those that have complete registrations, that have a sibling in a certain school, we assign them first, and then we assign everybody else. And then racial fairness guidelines. We look at that, trying to balance minority and non-minority in, in the schools. Oh, before I go on, I just would like to point um, the pictures in the bottom. Um, the first two to the left, those are um, pictures that we took last year during kindergarten registration at the Gilmore. Okay, we had a wonderful time there. And to the right, those crates have folders of kindergarten students. So that's how we work um, once February starts. We work from crates and from having folders, making sure that everyone, every folder is up to date and we keep calling the parents to make sure that they bring whatever they need in so that whenever we get to the deadline that we can start assigning students, okay? <coughs> Speaking of kindergarten, um, Speaking of energy, we need kindergarten students in our schools. So it should be somewhere, I don't know. Um, this year we registered for school 1,469 students. And um, for those students, and uh, last year we had 1,485, so a little bit less this year than last year until November 1st. And 1,119 students um, were assigned to a general education classroom. 175, 77 were assigned to the SCI classroom. 128 were assigned to special education classrooms. And 45 of them were assigned to the two-way program. So that's the placement. And as of today, we have 1,471 students in kindergarten, okay, in classrooms today. So not a huge difference from November 1st. These are the choices. Um, I am extremely happy to, to inform you that most students got their first choice, okay, out of 1,469, 1,149 got their first choice. And I think that's amazing. That is a great deal to us. It should be a great deal to the system just to show how great of a, of a job we can do and how we work with families. And those are the choices that family made because when they come in to register, we ask them to make three choices. So based on those choices, we assign. Um, out of those, you can see how many of them got their second choice, 109, 150 got their third choice, and assigned 161. And those students in kindergarten that were assigned to a school, those were students that did not complete the registration on time, that um, came during the summer, and when they came, everyone else had been assigned. 
So at those point, if they had chosen another school, a different school, of course we did not have seats at those schools. So they were assigned to a school where we had seats. Okay, so that's why we call them the assigned students, students assigned to a certain school. Grade six registration is um, is also um, a major part of what we do. We're actually doing it now. It will we're going to do it until next Friday. And um, so for last school for last year we did 1,311 students going into grade six. 1,000 of them minority students. 311 of them non-minority. And again, you can see how we divided them between going to Gen Ed, um, SEI classroom, SPED, TAG, and two-way at the Pluff. Okay. Results of the grade six, again, it looks very similar to kindergarten. Uh, 1,247 of them were assigned to their first school of choice, um, 39 to their second um, school, 9 to their third, and 16 that were assigned. And again, we have an appeals process. Um, we have an, a, a group that meets every month and we look at all the assignments and all the appeals that parents have requested. If parents are not happy with an assignment, they can appeal it. So if there's nothing I can do, we take it to the board and then the board decides based on the numbers and the reasons that the parents write down. Go ahead. Can you give an example of what type of situation would constitute getting a third choice? Mm -hmm. um, to that. For example, a student that lives um, right across from, let, let's say, East, East Middle School, okay, that student has chosen South Middle School as number one, West Middle School as number two, but that student lives right across from East. So in that case, I try to assign everyone because of proximity to school, I try to assign everyone who lives the closest to South, the closest to West, and then we go to the third pool to see who else can go in and where we have seats. So in this case, even though the student lives right across from East, the student has chosen two different schools that are far away from his, his home. So in that case, that student is assigned to East because that's the closest school to his house. So do, like, say for instance, most of the kids that go to the Huntington School, I would, wouldn't it stand to reason that most of those kids would go to the same middle school? Correct. Most of them do go to the same middle school. Mm -hmm. um, Huntington is one example. Most of them end up going to South because right. they live in that area. But then if we have a Huntington student who wants to go to North Middle School, for example, mm -hmm. if we have seats, we'll grant that. Yeah. If we don't have seats at North, then we have to look at those students who live the closest to North, who, ch who chose North as number one, right. as their first choice. Right. If we have seats, of course, I'll go back. I'll get that Huntington student and put him or her in there. If not, then the child will be assigned to South because that's the closest one to their house. And we always try to assign based on transportation as well. Mm -hmm. So just to make sure that the child is able to get transportation from us. Because if I assign a student who lives in the South Zone to North Middle School, that child will not be given transportation. So the parent will, ha will have to transport. Right. So it's safe to say that you don't have any situations with a student that lives across the street from South is not getting their first choice at South. They're getting, not getting their first choice if they just slept out of the, their district. Correct. OK. Great. Thank you. OK. We, when I assign, I usually go street by street, and I get all the students that live on that street, and I look at all their choices. Um, because people know people. So, and that's why we try to be as fair as possible. Because on the same street, I can have students, four students choosing South Middle School, for example, and I can have one choosing West. Um, so what happens is that I'll assign those four from South Middle School, that one from West, I'll put on hold until I can have a seat or until I'm, I'm able to swap students from one school to the other. So it's, a, it's an interesting game. Good? 
high school registrations. Um, high school registration is a two-fold process where um, students go there and parents, they go, they have to provide proofs of residency in order to be registered uh, for high school grades. And, um, and once they do that, we send the full list to Brockton High. And then Brockton High, Mrs. Ledger and her team, they will look and, um, and decide where the best placement for that student is. So um, for this school year, we registered uh, from June 1st until November 1st, we regist registered 230 students who are attending Brockton High uh, in general education classrooms. We also registered 148 students going into the bilingual program, um, the Spanish bilingual, the Cape Verdean, and the Haitian bilingual, and also low incidence. B.B. Um, Russell, one student, Champion High School, one student, Gateway, 12 students, uh, Pathways, four, Edison Academy, 25, Goddard, two, and outside placement, two students, okay? But again, all of those go through us, um, and then Broughton High will be the one assigning those students to the different programs and pathways. And I assume it's... It's basically special education. Right. That's okay. We don't have the services here, um, but the service can be found somewhere else. So the student is placed in a residence usually or something like that. Thank you. Okay. Transfers. Um, keep in mind that out of the... 5,400 transactions, 1,846 of those were transfers, okay? And those were the reasons for the transfers. Out of zone, we had 22 um, percent uh, were out of zone students. Out of zone students are students who live, for example, their residence is in the south zone, but they would like to attend the school in the northwest zone. So in that case, every year um, in June, we send a letter home where we ask parents to either check that yes, they do want to remain out of zone, or no. If they don't want to go to an out of zone school, then they can go back to their zone. So in this case, the south zone. If they want to remain at an out of zone school, then they apply for it again. If we have seats, we will allow the students to stay there. Usually we do. Um, but when we don't, we try to work with the parents so that they can make choices and go back to their zone. Last year was a bit of the pro a problem during the summer, but we were able to work it out and most students were called back, were sent back to their out of zone school. 18% um, were, uh, were transfers due to a move, people that moved within the city. 37%, that's the biggest chunk, those were transfers um, that happened from, Jan from um, June 1st until October 1st. Those were the transfers that people can transfer just because they feel like transferring, they don't like the school anymore, or they don't have transportation, or their babysit babysitter has moved. So they come in and they can transfer during the summer. After October 1st, we don't accept any more transfers. If they want to transfer out of school, then we deal with the Office of Teaching and Learning to see if that's possible. We also, with um, Mrs. Barry, and we work with Ms. Saba, or for middle school, we will work with M Mr. Murray and um, Mr. Thomas, just to make sure if that's something that we can do as an administrative transfer. Um, SCI mainstream is another one, 18% tag students and then SPED students that mainstream and they leave the SPED program going from one building to the other. If it's done within that building, then we don't see those parents, okay? Bilingual and SEI students, this year we almost have the same number as we did for last school year. Uh, last school year we had 539 students registered from June 1st to November 1st. This year we had 534 students. Most of them attend elementary schools. Um, then high school 20% and then middle schools only 9%. And most of those students are Cape Verdeans. Haitian community, Haitian students being the second largest and then students coming from Spanish speaking countries. Total registrations and transfers done by grade level, as you can see kindergarten and grade six are all the way up there because those are the biggest chunks. We have incoming students and then students going from grade five and elementary setting into grade six going to middle school. Where do our students come from? Um, mainly if they're coming out of the city, mainly they're coming from Boston neighborhoods. 
Okay. We also have received a lot of students coming from Randolph, a lot of students coming from Fall River and Taunton, so this is the order where they have come um, the most from. Um, out of state, Rhode Island is the first one with the most students, New York and Florida. A couple of years ago when the Haitian earthquake happened, we did receive a lot of students from Florida. Haitian students, um, but this year most of our students are coming from Rhode Island and New York. Okay, uh, out of country, Cape Verde, obviously, um, Haiti, Ecuador, and Portugal, and so forth and so on. Even a student from uh, three students from Afghanistan, and then um, other students coming from other places like charter schools, Montessori schools, private schools, Southeastern Regional, and then virtual online coming um, to Brockton Public. Results of the pre-K through 12 school assignments. So this, these are the, uh, the 5,240 um, students that I talked about. Out of all of those, you can see that most of them got their first choice. Okay, which again, I keep saying the same thing. I know I'm repeating myself, but uh, it, it's an amazing number compared to what we, how many students we register and how many of them we can accommodate. Of course, unfortunately, we cannot accommodate all of them. We would love to. Um, it, is, it is what it is right now, but we're happy to show that we do accommodate most of them and we make parents happy. Go ahead. The Taunton and Fall River, is that homeless? Or just request. Um, no, those are those are students that are coming to us. To us. Right. Okay, students that are coming to live here in Brockton. Okay. We do have a lot of homeless students that we transport that have been placed in Fall River and in Swansea. Um, so those those are still our students. So they they don't live here. They live in ta in Fall River and Swansea, and we transport them back and forth because their uh, school of origin is Brockton. So we do have to transport them. Thank you. Okay, that's um, total enrollment. You can see the total by grade totals by grade level, and you can see how much we have grown from 2011 to today. Um, we have had a huge increase, okay, of students from 16,270 to 17,452. Again, um, that's a five-year comparison and a summary um, done by clusters, okay, by grade levels. Basically the same thing. And um, changes and innovations at the School Registration and Parent Information Center. New facilities as of December 1st. Um, the craftsmen and the, all the people that worked on it did an excellent job. Please go there and visit. It looks good. It's very well organized. Thank you everyone who worked on it. Thank you Mr. Thomas for putting up with me. Um, thank you everyone. And Mr. Thompson as well. And I do like the teller counter. Um, the ESL teacher at the school registration office has done a great job. Um, it's, it, we're so glad that she is there because she is the first person that everyone sees. She asks questions about um, the language or languages that are spoken at home and based on those answers the students are placed in the program that they're supposed to go into. And when we assign students to a school, the bilingual folder is right there, so all the school has to do is open the folder and see where the child has been placed. Okay, all the information is there. Um, in the past, it used to be that students would be placed, and then they would be tested, and if they needed to be transferred to a different school, they were transferred after being already placed in a school, which didn't make much sense. So now we're being proactive doing it before they go in. Um, we do have electronic registration forms, very legible. They are in the big book, the, the report that you received, they are all the way in the back. Uh, and we are working with a company on having online pre-registrations. Okay, parents are spending a, an average of half an hour to 45 minutes in our office, but we want to make sure that we minimize that time. So if they have access to the internet, access to a computer, we want them to pre-register before coming in. We'll get an email with that registration. By the time they come in, we have everything ready for them. They just have to provide us with the proofs of residency and immunization. So we're working on it. Hopefully next year when I come back here, I'll be saying that to you that it's good, it's up and running, and it's, doing, it's going well. Um, 
We also have electronic registration forms for bilingual students in four languages. We have a kiosk uh, a, a queuing system. So parents come in, they're asked for questions. I was, showing, I was showing off the machine to Mrs. Joyce when she came in to visit. It, it works well because we know who is there, we know how long they have, um, how long we took to work with them, why they were there, and at the end of the day, we can just hit the button and we have a report, okay? Uh, and we can even see how many times one person has come in throughout um, the week or during the summer. Um, also, since January of 2014, uh, we have been taking pictures of students and importing those students into the database. So by the time the students start school, there's a picture of that student, so the teacher, the staff at the school know who the student is. So it's getting better every day, it's getting faster every day, um, but that's something that we started doing this year. And lastly, we have a service survey it's also in your book. Um, I have copy, copies of it that we give to, to parents as they come in and as they work with us. Because um, we know that we're doing a lot, but we do want to do better, and we want suggestions as well and comments on how well we do. So um, out of 1,429 people that were surveyed, um, most of them, as you can see, um, said that we're doing an exceptional work. Um, so that's, that's very interesting. And this um, survey is also um, translated into Cape Verdean, into Portuguese, Spanish, and Haitian, so that parents can have access to it in different languages. OK? And thank you very much. But also, like I said in the beginning, this is not my report. This is a report of a group of people. So thank you very much. these buildings and programs uh, online. Um, and again, Mr. Thomas did do yeoman's work in making this happen. So thank you for recognizing thank you. that. Uh, one of the things that I do want to bring to your attention, um, as we begin the kindergarten process, I know a facility meeting uh, happened, I believe, January 13th. Um, you know, on that date, there was some discussion about how we would view kindergarten registrations, which are coming up very soon. I know that will come before us to vote on it at the January 27th subcommittee meeting and will be before you, I believe, February 10th, because we will be going forward uh, with our kindergarten registration. I also think uh, at some point as we start to work on policies, uh, one of the things uh, Soraya brought to your attention was we expect parents, again, uh, looking at your policy to fill out these forms in a timely manner. One of the things that has become very frustrating is numbers of announcements go out to families, letting them know that they could have two or three kids in a school and that it's time for the sibling to enter kindergarten. And many times it is just expected that the sibling will be able to go to whatever the school of choice is. Many times if the parent is late in doing that, those seats have filled up and you know for a while the uh, Barrett Russell, a wonderful kindergarten center, has kind of been a, an overfill for us when we couldn't accommodate in schools. You know, sibling preference I think is important when you're sending numbers of kids to go together to a school. So I think we need to take a look at some of these uh, policies. Let's just review them and take a look at the district and all of the efforts that we're making and, and see if it um, makes sense to us at this point because there have been some concerns. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Barrows? There's two I think that came up uh, before. One was on the updating, I guess, of, of in essence, the forms and mainly the information in some cases that some of the over the years, I guess, because of uh, movement or changes and emergency, those kinds of things. Do you have any idea on how that's working out or how that's? We have, um, at this moment, about 500 families that are homeless in Brockton. Okay. Um, we work very closely with the Title I office in trying to provide um, services and trying to provide transportation to those parents. Um, and like I, I mentioned before, a lot of those students um, are also living outside of Brockton. They were in Brockton before they lost their house for 
whatever reason, and now they're um, living there. When the, when the parents come here, and a lot of times they will come to us, they will not inform us, they will not let us know that they're homeless. Um, so we have to dig in until we get to that point. And once we do, then again, we contact people, we contact services, we let the schools know. Uh, when a child is placed, there's an email that is sent out saying that the child is homeless. Um, when the child, when the parent comes in, and that the child is placed the next day into a school, just so that we don't we don't waste a lot of time, and that st that student doesn't waste a lot of time at home waiting for a school placement. So everything is done to the best to help that child the best we can. And, um, and like I said, we contact services, we contact doctor's office, we try to work with the parents to the best of our ability. And if the parent does not speak English or the parent is, um, can be an immigrant, then there are services that we also contact to make sure, like Cape Verde Association in this case, to make sure that we have all the services for that parent. You all set, Ozzy? Yes, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? All right, thank you. Thank um, you. Just with respect to uh, this topic in terms of where students are coming from, I was uh, in a city south of Brockton today and I was speaking to a mother of two with one on the way and she asked me, where are you from? And I told her I'm from Brockton. And she's like, ah, oh, I wish I was still in Brockton. The schools there are great. Um, it was just very flattering to hear her speak highly about wanting to get back to Brockton and to get her kids back in the Brockton public schools. Uh, you know, the reputation of this school district is well known, especially you know in, in I would say cities and urban centers you know throughout the state. And this mother just was regretting her move a few years back. So, in retrospect. Um, okay, next item I see is Ms. Barry, uh, Mrs. Like Barry. Like Deputy Superintendent Barry, uh, and also I might as well bring Executive Director uh, June Saber McGuire up also as we're gonna give you an update on our strategic plan, but we're gonna talk right now about a wonderful uh, science materials donation that came in uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, Manthala George actually connected us with um, Jeffrey Miller. He's the Vice President of Philanthropy at Brockton Hospital. And he let us know that the Young Scientist Club um, is an outfit that was looking to um, make warehouse space um, in their in their organization um, and because of that we received um, 2,000 of this explore the explore space kit and 2,000 of this save the earth kit um, which fits nicely with the next generation science standards for grade 5 so we're going to be distributing those to schools and teachers will be using the kits to model the scientific process um, because the science fairs are coming up up, and the scientific process is the basis for the science fairs. Um, so 2,000 of each kit, um, and we were told that it's a, a donation that's worth about $20,000 if they were to sell the kits wholesale. So we're very appreciative that um, Mr. George thought of us um, when the opportunity came up. It's interesting, uh, you know, Mr. George was certainly the superintendent in some of my early years here in the Brockton Public Schools. Um, it is wonderful to have opportunities. He cares about the school. He shows up at the George School for a number of their Christmas holidays. I had the opportunity to take him around uh, back in the fall to actually see a number of the classes. Um, he is just a great resource for me uh, going back all of these years. It's funny how some things just don't change. So he has been a, a wonderful support and continues to be for the Brockton Public Schools. Thank you. So one thing that we also talked about uh, on our agenda is to continue to have our strategic plan be on the agenda so you can hear the progress and the real work that is going on behind the strategic plan. 
many of the comments from you originally when this was presented back in August was all about, again, benchmarks, who owns the goals, how are we going to know when the strategies uh, have been reached, or, or what progress is the district at. We are working with the Educational Delivery Institute, uh, EDI, who uh, is a consulting group working with us, again, to make sure that it takes root in the district and that all of us are, are comfortable and certainly alert as to what's happening. So I'll have Deputy Superintendent uh, Barry update you on that and uh, June Saber mcguire talk to you a little bit about the school improvement plans and how they're relating to the district uh, strategic okay. plan. So we just have a very quick PowerPoint. Oh, I didn't know I said um, I believe the last time um, that you were updated on the strategic plan, we actually had Corey Sullivan from EDI here, and um, she talked to you a little bit about um, their brown paper. Um, and so the last time that you were updated, this is actually where we were. This is an activity that we completed um, that very day prior to school committee. Um, that day we prioritized initiatives that fell under um, instructional excellence, which is our first area of focus, and we also identified student outcomes that would illustrate to us as a district that we are actually meeting the goals um, that we set within instructional excellence. Um, since that time, um, we spent the last couple of weeks working from that original activity on brown paper and identifying overlap and replication. Um, instructional excellence in the district strategic plan is actually the most comprehensive. So we spent some time just trying to figure out where we could link initiatives um, and where we would see overlap so that we had a very clear picture of what we needed to do as a district. Um, we found that the initiatives for instructional excellence can actually be organized into four big areas or buckets, and we're calling those areas strategies. The first is collaborative culture. The second is a development and delivery of an aligned curriculum and assessment system. The third is student supports and interventions. And the fourth relates to teacher growth and development. Um, within each one of those four strategies, we spent, some, we spent some time talking about what district initiatives look like under there, but we also um, found that some of the strategies um, were more specific to schools. And I'm actually going to have Ms. Sabre McGuire talk to you a little bit about the school improvement planning, which is happening at the same time that we're doing the district planning. So um, I want to again thank Liz Barry and um, Dr. Murray for presenting the school improvement pl plan back about a month and a half ago when I had laryngitis. <laughs> but I have to say that I was really excited about um, presenting the school improvement plan and it was also presented at a K-12 principals meeting and one of the things that um, I think the school improvement plan has so much opportunity for is the idea that we're really connecting the strategic plan to the work that is going on in schools and that's the whole point point of presenting the school improvement plan and making it something that is an actionable, actionable document in the school so it doesn't just become what we always fear when we ever when we create documents and that's just something that takes space up on a, on a um, bookcase. So I can tell you that I know I've talked to Dr. Murray about it and I've certainly talked to Principal Walder and I know from presenting at the elementary principals meeting meetings that we've gotten really positive feedback about how the schools are um, using the school improvement plan, connecting it to the strategic plan, and really making it something that I would I would think in um, the superintendent's origi original vision when she was bringing the stakeholders from across the city together to look at how we were going to really work on district level improvement, making sure that that gets down to the school level is the most important piece. And we've gotten some really positive feedback across the entire district. Thank you. So um, as, as late as today, we actually spent some time looking at those four areas and identifying who is going to be the goal owner for instructional excellence, as well as who will be the owners for each one of those four strategies. Um, our next steps is we now have to look at year one priorities for the two remaining areas of focus. We have supportive environment left, and we also have community engagement. We will then, again, just like we did with instructional excellence, we'll delineate between school-based strategies 
strategies and district strategies. Um, and again, thinking about the role that school improvement planning will play um, as those school-based strategies come to light. Um, the other thing that we will then do is identify goal owners and strategy owners in order to develop plans for, for those other two focus areas, supportive environment and community engagement. Um, EDI is actually coming back to us at the end of February, um, and it is a Tuesday, so it's possible that um, if if you would like, she could actually provide an update to you as well. Um, when she is here, I'm not sure if it's going to be Corey or someone else or, or other members of the team that some of you met when they did the focus um, group interviews, but um, they will actually work with the goal owners and the strategy owners to develop what they call delivery plans so that um, as we begin to think about implementing um, initiatives that fall under these three areas, um, what, are, what are the student measures that we're using and how are we regularly reporting progress um, as, as a matter of our routines. strategies, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, who would be the goal owner and who would be the, um, the strategy owner okay. in a case like that? Could it, they both be the principal or would they be two separate people within that school? Yeah, how would that look? So the school improvement plans will play a big role in, in um, articulating that better. One of the things that we were charged to do with EDI is to focus on the district initiatives first and to make sure that we have um, goal owners and strategy owners for those uh, strategies that we recognize as being district. Right. Um, part of our own process would be to review the school improvement plans, but also as a district to say, how are we supporting schools in meeting their goals and meeting their targets? So we don't have goal owners and strategy owners for the school-based initiatives. Um, and I suppose those would be the principles, but that's not part of their process. So how does the, which way does the information flow? Does it come from the schools to the district level or from the district to the school level? Or is it a combination? It would be a combination of both. Uh, for instance, with the school improvement plan, or one of our strategies is collaborative culture. So that's some of the work that we're doing at the district level with our principals. So that's an example of how the strategic plan impacts school practice and vice versa. So that would be part of their school improvement planning. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So it's coming yeah, right it from the strategic an plan. Or an example where what you're doing at the Huntington could become a district goal or strategy? Well, one of, let me, one of the strategic initiatives is promoting higher order thinking skills, mm -hmm. right? That comes right from the strategic plan. I could put up the Huntington School Improvement Plan and show you that that's one of our school-based action steps okay. and that we've actually integrated that into all of our, our subject content areas. Mm -hmm. You'll see it in ELA, you'll see it in math, and you'll see it in science. Mm -hmm. So that comes right from the school base. That I just pulled that one out just because it's a, an initiative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the school improvement plans, um, the way that they are formatted, schools would um, designate um, school-based initiatives, but then they would also have to talk about what their targets are within their school improvement plan. So it wouldn't happen as part of the EDI process, but as we talk about what we're doing as a district to enhance collaborative culture, we would want to make sure that we're giving tool, uh, sco schools the tools so that they can support the school-wide initiatives that they have as well. That is, uh, I've been out in the schools, um, sticking to my schedule, which is the best part of my week to really get into the school to look at. We're looking at school culture, instructional practices. Uh, we're looking at ways that this districts can support the schools. And it's interesting when you talk about best practices. Yeah. And we've been talking about this with the principals. This will be the kind of plan that, as we're out there and schools are impl implementing their school improvement plans, if there are best practices, something that's working, that comes back to the district level. It could be 
a total change in what we're doing strategically also. So those kinds of uh, sharing of best practices in the district certainly informs the district improvement plan right, as we go exactly along also. That's exactly what I was thinking about. Okay, and, great. Um, I, I, again, a, as we continue to do this, it reminds me of our discussion we just had about the superintendent goals mm -hmm. and the benchmarks. And again, this really ties in yeah, very does. nicely mm -hmm. with when we talk about this year, what we're able to accomplish is certainly tied in with the superintendent goals and the benchmarks and the key action steps that will inform you Absolutely. of the progress going on in the district yeah. in a number of the areas. Okay, and we'll continue to bring this forward uh, to you so you'll see the progress that we're making and you know, we'll, we'll share what's happening with the uh, strategic planning. Yeah. Anyone else? No? Okay. Thank okay. you both. Uh, next, I actually have some good news in the area of grants. Um, and that is, uh, you've heard us certainly talk about the district capacity project that has been presented to you a number of times. We talk about an international school. We talk about dual language programs. One of the things that our uh, district capacity team presented, I want to say about a month and a half ago, to the DESE office, uh, the innovation schools, uh, was the possibility of garnering uh, a grant to help us planning with this district capacity project. We were notified uh, by the DESE just about a week or so ago that we received a $75,000 grant to move this work forward. I'd like to invite uh, Laurie Silva and Dr. Kathleen Moran down uh, to talk to you a little bit about our plans. We met on Thursday. So Mr. Minicello represented the school committee. Uh, our district capacity team uh, met to take a look at, I don't think it's exactly 75, I want to say it's, it's a, little a little bit shy of that. And we actually uh, planned what we would do with that money. I don't think we have a lot of time to spend it. We're trying to at least push it forward till the end of August. That was one of the things we had talked about with the um, DESA committee when we did the interview, that that was a possibility that they were looking at. As it currently stands, the grant um, needs to be spent down by uh, June 30th, which is a very tight time frame for us. We were really looking for the expanded period of going through the summer to do the planning process. But regardless, we're, we're, um, we're prepared to move forward. Um, the plan that we had presented to Jesse and our uh, prospectus, our proposal, was to basically use the time frame that they allotted to use for stipend payments to work with planning committees to move the prospectus that we had originally designed to flesh it out basically it was um, it was a, a rather strange proposal because they were basically looking for a proposal to how are you going to plan for a plan <laughs> So we, we worked upon what we had um, been working on for the district capacity project for the past two years and we built upon that for what we foresaw is how we would move it forward. So what we basically talked about and what we're moving forward is there's a, a small internal team of us that will be meeting on a weekly basis every Monday from 930 to 1030 or 1130 um, and we'll basically from now until early spring basically plan on exactly what the benchmarks are and what the outcomes that we're going to be looking for as we work with the full planning team. We uh, f were funded for having basically a team of 20 individuals that we will do job ads uh, through the HR office for people to work on this prospectus to flesh it out to be a full proposal for an innovation school and so our weekly meetings will really focus on exactly what do we want this team to do what are the time frames that they need to have things done by completed by what is the the final end product that we need to have that we can work with DESE to move this initiative forward one of the other major, or a, a few of the other major things that we need to work on in this time frame as well is in the prospectus that we proposed, there are, for an innovation school, there are autonomies that we need to work forward 
in working with union and also the district. Some of those autonomies were based on budget, some was on curriculum, some was on instructional practices, planning times, professional development. So all of those things need to be worked upon in a collaborative fashion, which is exactly what's been happening with the district capacity plan to begin with. So it's just moving that forward and really working with internal you know, stakeholders as, how, as far as how is that going to look as we move this project forward. One of the other major things which is really huge which needs to stay in the forefront is facilities. So the facilities master plan that has been um, moving forward needs to stay in the forefront of this whole project. What we're initially thinking now um, is that we're probably going to be looking at creating an academy, which is a school within a school, before we move forward to creating a full separate identity of a school. So facilities is going to be a huge piece that we need to you know, maintain as a focus as we move this project forward. So one of the things that we've been doing so far is we've established some wonderful collaborative connections with DESI, which is going to be key as we're moving this entire project forward, because um, they are going to be a, a, a major stakeholder as we work not only with district leadership, union leadership, but they also need to be a partner as we move this initiative forward. It's a very exciting opportunity for the district, um, especially seeing as though we're looking at um, a charter school trying to come in. This is one of the major ways that we can, um, if we're able to bring this innovation school in, it's a wonderful way for us to show that what we can do internally in Brockton is the best. As the superintendent already mentioned, you last received your update from the district capacity project team um, at your retreat on December 6th. Um, other than the great news about the grant, not much, much has changed. We do continue to meet every month to two months with that team, and um, this will be a large focus of the work that we do for the rest of this, this uh, school year. So we're very excited and pleased. Yes. yes. Any questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on, I just want to remind everybody of a letter that we actually sent back last June. We were talking about a very difficult budget season and one of the things that we kept talking about was looking for some support because of the growth in our district, um, the restrictions of our budget. We put a letter together, we sent it to uh, Commissioner Mitchell Chester and one of the accounts that they have is something called a, a pothole account, which is titled the Foundation Reserve Program under FY15. We applied in a timely manner, you know, uh, citing a number of the budget difficulties we had last year, the large number of students, the growth, etc. We received a letter on January 5th uh, telling us that because of the recent cuts, the 9C cuts, that uh, it restricted their ability to support applications and as a result they were not able to support any continued applications this year. Um, I, I also took a look at um, it, a, a document on contrasts in state spending from 2000 to 2015. It talks about health care is up from 21% to 38% of the budget. And we know that we're feeling that right here in our own district. It talks about elementary and secondary education in 2000 being funded at 16% of the budget. It's down to 11%. So it just seems to continue to be bad news for us as we as we look to, to continue to support uh, needier students, uh, larger numbers of students, and we'll continue to do that. On another note, um, we talked about, uh, the, the mayor gave his uh, State of the City address last Thursday, a number of us were there. Um, you know, congratulations to the mayor for presenting uh, his first year in office, a number of the initiatives. Uh, one of the things uh, that came up was uh, the discussion about the schools. And the mayor and I have had a lot of discussions about this. Uh, he certainly has every faith in the leadership, and the leadership being our school committee, our administration, um, 
certainly uh, our school principals, et cetera, leading the work in the district. Uh, that being said, I'm really excited to tell you that we will give our state of the schools address. Uh, I had a phone call today from Councillor uh, Azak from Ward 7. She's looking to put forward a resolve. There was talk about February 17th, that is February vacation. I really would like the opportunity for parents, for teachers, for people to be there, or certainly, I think those are live also, the uh, City Council Finance Committee meetings. So we will have our opportunity uh, to do our State of the Schools address. Uh, what I would like to do also, when we do the State of the Schools address, we talked today during our executive team, of making sure that this is a document that talks about our successes this past year, talks about um, our many programs, talks about our challenges. I think we definitely need to start, and it's not that we have stopped talking about some of the program cuts that we made this past year that were very concerning to all of us as far as the impact on our children and our families. So this kind of a document uh, leading into our budget for FY16 is a budget that can educate our parents, can educate our community members, can educate our teachers and our staff so that we can continue to have the advocacy that we need to make sure that our schools are funded the way they need to be funded to move the district forward. So I'm excited to, uh, I'll get back to you on the dates. One of the dates I believe was March 3rd, which to me would be an ideal date before we actually get into to the budget season. So I'll keep you updated as Councillor Azak puts forward the resolve. Um, also, I want to update you on a couple of the appointments. Uh, one is, uh, again, at the uh, Downey School. We have uh, moved up the assistant principal to be the uh, interim uh, principal, John Kelly. We spoke about that last time. Filling his role in an interim uh, assistant principal is uh, Joanne Folan, who has been at the Downey School for many years, is part of their leadership team, and they will continue to work with that school till the uh, end of the year, where we will be advertising for permanent positions throughout the district. Also, um, we have uh, Mary Beth O'Brien, who oversees our extended learning time uh, facilitator at the Huntington School. Because the work is so great and we have our executive director, June Saber McGuire, really uh, working two jobs as principal and executive director. We're uh, allowing uh, Mary Beth to come on as an interim principal to join Mr. Molinari while June is away from the school to support that school, to continue the evaluations, and to take us again through the rest of this year where we'll take a look at some of the permanent solutions uh, to, to uh, filling these positions. I also want to update you on the um, elementary wellness focus on the great collaboration. At the uh, middle schools, the semester has changed so we're continuing to work in our seventh grade classes as were proposed and we are working in five of the elementary schools we finished up with the great presentation at the Huntington and we're working now at the Angelo the Baker the Downey and the Kennedy so I um, met with the mayor today and continued that focus and we'll keep you updated uh, as that moves along um, I also want to uh, briefly talk about uh, a couple of things. One is, I'm sure in the Enterprise, you st saw the uh, editorial saying the state should reject the Brockton Charter School. That was certainly based on, again, the rebuttal. Um, it certainly brought a lot of the concerns that we had to light. Um, and, and I think this is something, if you haven't had an opportunity to see this, please read this editorial because, uh, uh, again, the editorial board took a look at the rebuttal and had a lot of questions about the charter at this time in our school district. The vote will be, I believe, I think I was saying February 25th, I believe it's Tuesday, February 24th. We will have a presence at that meeting and we will keep abreast of what is happening with the charter school. And one last note, um, I had the opportunity to attend the uh, 29th annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. NAACP uh, breakfast. Um, it, it was a, a wonderful event, but more than being wonderful, uh, Principal Wolder was unable to join me this year. Uh, she was back home in Iowa, and uh, I did have Dr. Cliff Murray join me, but the best thing of all was our high school students that joined us. And when I say they were poised, they were attentive, they were wonderful table mates to have to talk about uh, their aspirations, their college applications, you know, what you're doing. I had to be the proudest person sitting there having the attendees from the high school sitting there with me. So a wonderful event. I know a number of you were also present at it and I just want to congratulate the NAACP for an excellent event. I think credit also needs to go out to our fellow school committee member Patricia Joyce, 
nice article in the Boston Globe where she um, argued point and counterpoint with respect to the benefits of extended learning. She certainly knows a lot about that, being uh, the school committee person in the ward where the Huntington School is located. And she did a fine job when you <laughs> compare the, um, the uh, writings of the person that uh, is against uh, extended learning. I just think that uh, Mrs. Joyce's facts and reasoning um, glow in comparison. And your picture's not bad either. <laughs> so, um, I had a great deal of assistance from this uh, There are some fingerprints on this? Is that uh, what you're A lot saying? of fingerprints oh, on okay. that. Okay, well, <laughs> you both did a great job. It's a very nice article. Thank so. you. Um, items to refer to subcommittee. I know that Mr. Jordan mentioned at our prior uh, subcommittee on superintendent's contract that we should meet again, but why don't we wait for the timing when you um, redo some of those um, benchmarks, benchmarks and uh, that way we'll know how to time that subcommittee meeting. Okay. Um, and I believe we have meetings coming up with the curriculum subcommittee. We'll have a presentation on teaching strategies gold in our special education department. I believe that's February 3rd. Great. Okay. Um, anything else for subcommittees? Anyone? No? Okay. Um, anything under um, unfinished business? Seeing none. How about new business? Um, it does say report on superintendent's contract subcommittee. Do you want to push that over or to the next time? We have the minutes, the actual minutes. Which would be February 10th. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing that needs to be acted on this evening, so okay. why don't we have the actual minutes and we'll just push this to the next meeting. Okay. Is that okay? Good. Okay. Um, there's no need for executive session, I do not believe. Um, the mayor expressed his regrets. He is at the um, finance subcommittee meeting uh, over at City Hall with the councilors and could not attend. Um, is there anything else? Um, if people could give Mr. Robinson a pat on the supportive pat on the back because his team let the game get away from them. So, yes, please say hello to Mr. Robinson. He's feeling a little blue today. Um, anything else? No? Seeing one? All in favor? Great. Thank you. Thank you.